Hi, I'm Trapper Hallam. I'm one of your Utica Community Schools instructional technology coaches. And today, we're here to talk about flipped learning or flipped classroom learning. In this video, we're gonna talk about what flipped classroom learning is, we'll talk about what it is to me, we'll then talk about some of the benefits and challenges, and then we'll also talk about what do you need to flip your classroom. I'll give you an example of a weekly schedule so you can see what that looks like. We'll take a look at some strategies, some different types and different ways that you can use to flip classroom learning. And then finally, I'll give you some tips and we'll top it all off with a guest speaker. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Well, the first thing that we should discuss when talking about flipped classroom or flipped classroom learning is what is it? At its core, the instruction that you give inside of your classroom, where you stand if you're thinking in a traditional sense and talk to your students, or if you happen to show an instructional video, you take that content, you capture it into a video, and then you provide that to your students for home. They watch it at home. And then when they come back to the classroom, it opens up that time period for you to do any of the pedagogies, activities, or instructional strategies that you want to try. Now you don't have to spend your whole class time, that special class time with you, right? The one that knows how to instruct them, not focused on giving them the content. Well, here are some other ways that we can define what a flipped classroom learning or environment looks like. One, it's going to be student-centered and teacher-facilitated. You're not going to be in front of the classroom as much. The students are. You're going to see lots of student discussions, uh, groups, think pair shares. You're also going to see lots of hands-on activities, usually in the form of problem-based learning, something where the students are discovering and figuring something out. You're also going to see lots of peer mentoring. Students that understand the content are going to be helping students that are emerging on the content. So to get a better look at this, let's take a look at the infographic that I made where I explained it a little bit more personal to me and what it looked like in my classroom. So let's take a look at that. The first benefit to me was one of solving a problem. The problem of being in front of the classroom for almost the entire hour, shooting information at my students constantly, but never knowing how well they understood it because the time that we had to work on it in class was so limited. I never really had that chance to sit down to my students. I was just constantly spewing information at them. If they didn't understand something, our time was very limited for me to identify that problem and even less time to try to fix it individually. So flip learning provided me the opportunity to take these lessons that took so much time out of my classroom and make them into a video, a video that the kids could watch at home. And if they didn't understand something, they could easily rewind that video and go back over it a few times to get a better understanding. And better yet, I could build in genuine real world inquiry into their instruction. And it wouldn't take out our time of the classroom to do this. I could show them a video of somebody playing basketball and have them pose questions. So when they came in the class the next day, we could have a discussion that included the math behind what would happen if you shot a basketball. Now we'd have time for discussions, even student-centered discussions where they talked about the basketball and the possible math, something we never had time for before. Then I could show them just enough math to kind of get them going because now they're thinking about it, they're inquiring about it. But better yet, after I get my class going, now I've got time to individually work with my students and see what their issues are or their successes are. The ability to work individually with all of my students was something that I've never had before. This was amazing to me, and this was the problem that I was trying to solve. But you start putting this all together, and an idea comes to my mind. Instead of spending all this time in front of my class and letting them know about me and my information, now I can transform this space into something student-centered, something where they're in front of the stage constantly, where they're the ones speaking, where they're the ones creating questions, where they're the ones peer editing each other. 
having discussions, having collaboration, solving problems individually, in groups, think, pair, share. All of these ideas and things that I've used in my classroom all started to come together. It provided the opportunity for me to use my classroom time much more efficiently and in a different way. We could do problem-based learning. We would build devices in our classroom and then use math to compete with them. A completely different view from the math that I've ever done before. Really what this did is it moved me out of the center and it put the spotlight on my students, allowing me to create that student-centered classroom that I've been looking to make. And it helped me solve that problem. Now I really got to know my students. Now you're probably wondering, why should I be considering flipping my classroom? It's probably a good time to bring up the benefits and the challenges that come with flipping your classroom. What you'll see when you flip your classroom is that you'll see a better short-term student learning outcomes. This is usually because of all the other benefits, because you're working with students and you have time to adjust your curriculum. You have formative assessments you can do at the beginning and end of class. You'll be in the classroom with your students having more interactions. So because of these interactions, you're going to see and be able to adjust students and their knowledge and where they're having issues much quicker than you would be if you were lecturing. You're also going to have more time for problem-based learning opportunities. Problem-based learning has become more prevalent with our evolving standards. Flipping your classroom now provides you more time in class to develop these concepts. You're also going to see more student collaboration and peer mentoring. Not to mention the fact that you can now differentiate using the videos for students ahead and or behind. And one last benefit is that you're going to see less worksheets to grade. Why? Because you're going to be doing more things in class. So the grading will change. You won't be grading piles of worksheets day in and day out. With anything new, there's going to be challenges in figuring it out. But what we're going to talk about is a few of the challenges that you should be aware of as we go through this. Group activities can increase stress on some students. You'll also find that technology can now interfere with your content instruction at home. Some teachers that are very traditional in nature may find it a challenge to try these new techniques within their classroom. Initially, your teacher prep can also increase. You have to learn some of the new techniques, you have to learn some of the new technologies, so, and then you additionally have to create some of these lessons. But do note that these are temporary issues and all of these, with time, will decrease or not be a challenge at all. As you learn this, your, tech, your initial prep will decrease to almost where it becomes a benefit because these will already be established lessons. Hopefully you can see that these challenges can be overcome with time and, and effort and that the benefits are going to eventually far outweigh your challenges. So now that you've seen the benefits and the challenges, maybe we should talk about what things you need because you're thinking this is gonna be a big undertaking. I'm here to assure you though, it's not. You have everything that you need, basically already. First thing you need is a place to house your videos. You've got that, that's Schoology, right? Or whatever other platform that you're using for your digital space. Most of us in the district are using Schoology. You just need a place to put it. That's one location to do it. Uh, we'll also talk about Edpuzzle in just a minute, but next, you need a way to record your video. I'm assuming you've already got your content done, right? You've already created these lessons. You don't re need to recreate the wheel. That's a tip for later. You just need a way to record the videos. But we have that already. One, you can make a Teams meeting by yourself. You've seen that in our district. Record the video, download it from, from OneDrive. It's right there. Uh, you can do this in Stream, Microsoft Stream. You can also record with some other services like PowerPoint, Screencastify, Screencast-O-Matic. So whatever the services that you use to make your video, now you have a video. You have it contained. You have a place to put it. The only other big piece that you may need, or I guess a couple of pieces that may play into it, one is maybe you want some analytics on how that video is viewed. Maybe you want the ability to add some questions into the video to make it a little bit more diverse and check to see 
if the students are, are getting the content out of the video as they progress through. We can do that. That's called Edpuzzle. That's in our newsletter this month, and you should check that out. Also, you can add questions right in Microsoft Stream using a Microsoft form. So there's two ways to do that, adding questions into your video. Edpuzzle will give you the analytics though. It will also show you how much they watch it, how many times they repeat it. Um, there's a little more background to that. So it's very useful if you decide to dive in that far. And additionally, one other thing that you're gonna need, and we'll talk about that next, are different strategies or flipped classroom concepts or ways to do it that'll help you kind of develop into what works best for your classroom. All right, now it's time that we can talk about some strategies to use with our flipped classroom so we can kind of differentiate or change the way that we use it. So the first one that we should probably talk about is just the standard model. In the standard model, which is kind of the one that I use, was where I took my original lessons, I recorded them, I was able to write down on my screen, so I did a screen recording of my math, and then I would send that home with the students. They would watch that video, Again, I would make it shorter and more curtailed to what they needed to find out. So about 10 to 15 minutes. And then they would come back to class with just enough information on how to do this process that we were learning in math. From there, I'd give them an activity or we do some group work or sometimes even just a worksheet, especially when I was just getting started. Here, try this worksheet. But then the benefit was I could get around to the classroom to each student or groups of students and work with them. It's a very traditional sense, careful with that word, for flipped classroom learning. Record your lessons, send them home, work directly with the students in class during that time. Another one that you could use would be a discussion-oriented version of a flipped classroom. In this one, you could still record your lectures, but more likely what you're going to do is get a video from a good reliable source like TED Talks or Crash Course videos, and then you would take those videos, send them home, and the students would watch them, promoting some type of inquiry or something that would start a discussion. The next day they would come in and they would have that discussion. So you would facilitate a group discussion. Maybe again, I like to throw this around, think pair shares work really well with this. Smaller group work, any fashion that you choose to do that, okay? The next one we can talk about would be a demonstration focused um, flipped classroom. In this one, you would probably record yourself doing something in the classroom or have a video of something happening that the students would need to learn or watch. And then they could take this video, watch it at home again, and when they would come in, they would have to demonstrate that they knew that knowledge. If they didn't quite understand it, that's the best part. They could re-watch that video while you worked with them or worked with other students. So this one could be self-directed or self-paced with the students watching this piece of information that they need. And maybe it's a few videos, maybe it's not one, maybe it's a combination of a different set of videos and they, they work through them. The next strategy that we can talk about would be like what we would call a faux flipped classroom. This one, instead of sending the videos home, this would work better with younger students or maybe at the elementary where they don't necessarily need the homework at home. Instead, they can watch those videos in class. Maybe it's a station, they watch that video, that way you can be around at other stations and you can work with the other students. Maybe you pop into that station, but they're getting their instruction either from a video that you've captured or a video that you've created and working through that problem in the station. And they can rotate around to having different stations. So not every station has to be flipped. Maybe just a couple of them are flipped. Maybe it's just one. However that goes, it provides you the opportunity to teach some information to your students without sending it home, and they can still demonstrate that in front of you where you can work with them. The next one we can talk about, which is probably more appropriate for our current time frame, is what we call a virtual or a virtual flipped classroom. And as it sounds, it's pretty much what you can guess is that you do a flipped classroom, you record your videos, you record your instruction, and you send it home to the kids, but they're already remote, so they're virtual. So they watch that content and video virtually then they do your asynchronous work or whatever work that you've designed. Again, now your office hours are open so that they can check in with you or you can individually call students that maybe through a exit ticket or some type of formative assessment, you've notified or signified to you that there needs to be some more conversation. Again, freeing you up so that you're not talking that whole time period during your class virtual class hour. The last one, and probably the most exciting of these, which I used occasionally, because it does take some prep work, would be what we call flipping the teacher. 
So in this model, instead of you creating the videos that are instructing them, they're the ones actually creating the videos. So students make their own videos. And again, you can use this in a bunch of different ways. You could have them make the videos and then make a composite of a gallery walk. And then you could have all of the students watch each piece. And maybe each piece relates to some content on there. We've done this traditionally in our classrooms where we assign topics and then students present on it. This time though, they have the ability to, to create that video in any format that they like, allows them to be creative in the way that they make these videos. And then you get that added, almost peer, peer mentoring, peer editing type environment because now they can learn from each other. Um, there's lots of apps that we can use. Uh, Flipgrid is a great one for this where it allows you to create little clips and the students can walk through that gallery very easily. So there are a few of the strategies that you can use with the Flip Classroom. Okay, so we're gonna take a look at a weekly calendar now. We're gonna compare the differences over a week for a traditional style classroom and one for a flipped learning style classroom. Let's start by filling in the days. I'm gonna start with home one, which would be the weekend before the start of the fresh week. And then you can see class one, home two, class two, home three. You get the idea all the way down for a traditional week. Now for this example, we're gonna say we're starting with fresh content. So at the beginning of the week, we're gonna start with our first math concept. It's gonna be math concept one. At the end of the hour, I've got enough time to give an exit ticket, maybe answer a few questions. For that night, I'm gonna give them some book work or practice worksheets, something to do to kind of summarize that material. As you can see on the next class period, we're gonna repeat that, but we're gonna repeat it with a new concept. So we're gonna teach them two concepts this week, and they're gonna get another session of practice problems at home. When they come in the next day, they're gonna get an activity that they're gonna kind of go through and hopefully show me that they're understanding it fairly well. For homework, they're gonna finish that activity. And then finally, for that next class period, we're gonna give some review questions. So we're reviewing for our quiz, and then we're gonna have them finishing up as homework. They're gonna come in and they're gonna take that next quiz. What's important to note in this schedule is the limited number of opportunities for students to collaborate or work together, really develop those ideas. Teacher to student individual interactions are also limited here. Additionally, you'll also notice there's not a lot of activities. Most of this is information coming from the teacher to the student with only a few opportunities for the students to really work out their own learning. Now in a flip style learning classroom, our actual content will come the day before they come to our first class of the same week. So the students would have watched that math concept at home. They would have come into class with that knowledge we would have started right away with an exit ticket. This would have given us the ability to see what students picked up from that video and what misconceptions came out of that. Then we could have done like a math jigsaw activity within class where the students could have done a part of a problem or did a solution to a problem and then checked next door, but they would have done some type of a jigsaw where they could be working on that and collaborating in small pairs um, and even larger groups depending on how that goes. That next night, home two, we're gonna get that second math concept. They're gonna watch that content instructional video that, that I made, um, again, around 10 minutes, so far less than the homework that they're normally used to do. We're gonna repeat that idea of the exit ticket to get a, bit of, a good understanding of what this looks like, have a group discussion based around that, and then go into an activity or some problem-based learning activity where they can actually kind of take the time to explore. Um, on that night, they're gonna go ahead and share out some of that information in a Flipgrid. Um, which would be kind of like a group share. So there would be a video and students could watch and collaborate, you know, through providing extra comments on other students' videos. So great place to do that. On the next day when they would have come into class, we would discuss those responses that came out in the Flipgrid, probably highlighted a few of the really good ones, um, had a good discussion about that. Then we would have went into a review game over our topics where we could have done that. Quizzes is a great thing for that. In quizzes, they can do it individually. It's not like a hoot, so it's out loud. Um, and then we could have summarized that at the end. On that home day four, um, we would do an individual practice quiz. Um, they would go home and take that. It would be an open-ended quiz where they could take it and then bring it back to class. And then we would grade it for uh, accuracy, right or wrong. But then I would also take that same quiz and turn it into a multiple choice quiz. And then in the multiple choice quiz, I'd let them do it in pairs. So all they would know is if they got a question right or wrong individually, and together they would work that out. What that really does is bring out the reflecting and collaboration between two students to figure out what's right and what's wrong in those problems. Um, the next one would have gone home for home five to watch a review video. 
where the students would get some key points from me and they would study for their quiz and then eventually they would come in for that last day a little bit of questions in the morning and then take that quiz and we would be in the same spot as a traditional classroom what's important to note between the difference of a flipped classroom schedule the weekly schedule and a traditional one is that there is definitely more collaboration built into it um, more activities and projects where the students can discover the learning more teacher to student interaction at this if you look at the schedule i'm interacting with these students on a constant basis but not giving them content helping them develop their content so you can see that the week looks dramatically different even though we end in the same place and in reality the workload is also not larger for the students as well most of this is taking place during the school day and in many cases all they have to do is go home and watch a video which is a very individual activity but when they're in class not getting content but trying to understand it there are students there there's collaboration and there's the teacher they're well supported in their development of their understanding of these topics all right so now you've got all this information you know what flipped classroom learning looks like you have some strategies you got some benefits you've seen a calendar next let's give you some tips to get started because you can't just jump two feet in well you could but let's be honest maybe if we pace ourselves because there's a lot of things moving and a lot of moving parts in a classroom so jumping two feet in might be a lot so here's what we're gonna do first thing you should do is you should go out and find some some good information on flipped classroom learning Really what I'm trying to say here is grow your personal learning network or your PLN. Find some people on Twitter, find some YouTube videos or some people on YouTube that are giving out good content on flipped classroom learning or strategies or concepts or even examples of what that looks like. I'm gonna put down in the description some places that you can follow or you can always message me and I'll help you get in contact with these information resources so that you can kind of grow and learn as you go because you don't want me to be your only resource and you should never go at it alone so when we work together here we can really build in a nice network for you to kind of get started with this next there's no need to recreate the wheel you know what that means it means your existing content is the place to start you don't need to redevelop your lessons or change everything find a lesson that you like that you think would work well for this this is actually another tip pick out specific lessons that you know will do this well and do that first do that one lesson see how it goes learn a little bit don't do one every week maybe you can I'm not saying you can't but maybe you plan maybe you plan one for every quarter or every month maybe there's a schedule that you can find you're like all right this lesson this lesson and this lesson these are the ones that i'm going to focus on this year and then next year do a few more and after a few years or some time periods whatever you set up you'll find that you'll slowly transition into this right we were tossed into this by the pandemic you had no choice besides to move virtual but with flipping your classroom you do you have the choice to pick the lessons that you think best work that way and then other ones, you're like, maybe I redesigned this one this year. I've got some lessons already set up that frees up some time because those are already prepped. Maybe I can focus on this one. Maybe I'm going to go a different route. So that's the kind of the mindset that you want to do with this. Pick one or a few to start. The next tip I'm going to give you is that you do need to train your students. You can't just toss a video at them and expect them to take great notes and great information from it. You need to talk about what this should look like. Maybe you create a format for their notes so that you know that they're taking it. Maybe you use Flipgrid. Maybe you use Edpuzzle and you bring that into the classroom and say, hey, this is what this looks like. Maybe you say, hey, we could do one of these together. Train them how to take notes. Train them how to remove distractions so that they're not watching a video on the side while they're watching yours. Maybe you talk to them about not speeding it up to one and a half times, which they can do on some of these video resources. But there are ways, but it takes a minute, but you need to give them some good structures and routines so they know what this looks like, which plays into the last part. Inform your parents what this will look like. Talk to them, tell them, say, hey, we're going to instruct at home. This is what you should be seeing at home with your student. When they come to class, here's what we're going to be doing. Here's the benefit of what we're doing. Here's what you're going to gain. 
have that conversation, open that door and have these, these conversations with your parents so there are no surprises for them. The last tip I'm gonna leave you with is an important one. Now that you're flipping your classroom or when you do start to flip your classroom, you're free up time inside of your classroom walls or virtual if we happen to still be that way. What I want you to not to do or what I'm gonna urge you to be careful with is don't replace that time with additional work. Don't be confused. You're going to use that time to maximize the content that you sent home, maximize the learning of that content. What you're not gonna do is add a larger workload to the students. You're not gonna instruct them at home and then move on to a new topic during the next day. You, you don't wanna overload your students. This should not create more time for you to do more material. What it should allow you to do is have content at home so that you can be the facilitator in your classroom so that the students can better understand that content that you've already given them. So this should not increase your student's workload. If anything, it should decrease their workload to some extent because they're gonna be doing more things inside of the classroom. Not a lot of homework outside of whatever videos you send home. Additionally, if you start to follow that student-centered idea, now you should have a lot less work because you're not gonna be giving out worksheets in, in traditional type sense of things. You're gonna be gauging some of that inside of the classroom. So remember, not more work, less. All right, now it's time to wrap this video up. So let's do a quick summary of everything that we've talked about throughout our time together. First, flipped learning is taking your instruction and sending it home. Opening up your classroom so that you can be the facilitator, helping you to create a student-centered classroom. Don't forget, you basically have everything that you need. All the technology is in your hands, and really all you need to do is add maybe one more piece of analytics with your Z-Puzzle in this newsletter and or some videos that accompany it that'll show you how to do that. But that's a bonus. You don't need that. Additionally, there is a shift in your pedagogy, your understanding or the way that you teach. Maybe you're making that transition, maybe you've made it, maybe you haven't started it and you're still very traditional. In any case, you can start small, start slow, and do a lesson, maybe two, whatever you feel like you can handle in this time frame. If it's none right now, take a pause, save this video, and come back to it when you do have time. Because I guarantee you, the benefits that we've talked about outweigh the challenges. And you'll find that it'll reinvigorate the way that you teach. It'll change the way that you are in your classroom with your students and how you view your students. Next, don't forget, there are different strategies for this flipped classroom. It's not straightforward as that's just sending the video home. There are different instructional models that you can use with the flipped classroom and different styles that we've covered that'll help you kind of change and fit into your curriculum. All right, so before I sign off and I say thank you for participating in this discussion with us and hopefully that you learned some information about flipped classroom and how that looks, I'm gonna leave you with our guest speaker. Mr. Brandon Lemley is gonna leave you with a few words of how that looks in his classroom. And without further ado, I'm gonna kick you over to him, but I just wanted to say thanks and hopefully we'll see you next time and maybe you learned a thing or two. Hi, my name is Brandon Lumley and I'm a teacher at Jeanette Junior High. I've been asked to talk to you about some of the ways we use technology in our classroom. I know early in our careers, we always talked about as we were adding technology into the classroom, how scary it could be and what can we do with the technology and not feel like we're losing our security blanket of lecturing, having discussions with our kids and so on. Over the course of the last year, we've been dealt with a lot of hardships, but one of the nice things we've had is all of our kids have had the access to technology one-to-one. -to -one. One of the things I've tried to do more of is flipping my classroom. And when I say flipping, I mean, let's incorporate technology with the students, but allow them to do a lot of that work at home. So when they get into class, we can have more engaging learning activities with them. For instance, over the last couple of weeks, we have discussed Athens versus Sparta in my classroom. So instead of me doing a traditional stand up in front of the class, lecture, discuss with the kids. I allowed them to do a lot of the learning at home with uh, discovery videos that I was able to incorporate some reading activities, some higher level inquiry 
questions that they did at home. So when they came to classroom, we are allowed to have an engaging activity. This activity took place in two different varieties. The first part of it was a Socratic discussion between my students where they were allowed to discuss the pros and cons of being uh, Athenian or Spartan. They debated back and forth over which one had the most pros and cons, who wanted to live in which area, why they wanted to live in, and so forth. When they were done with that, hearing multiple different uh, viewpoints from other students, all student-led, which was fantastic, because I got to sit back and probe and ask different questions to pique their curiosity and get them to dive into the information a little deeper. Then they were creating poster projects where then they had to take the idea of selling a campaign just like we had in our last presidential candidate uh, presidency race and we allowed the students to pick would you want to live in Athens or Sparta and try to convince other people by creating poster propaganda to showcase which one you thought was the better place to live. After we did that then they also created a flip grid like I'm using right now where they talked in detail about why they chose Athens or why they chose Sparta. And then they walked us through their poster and kind of presented their information, just like you would have seen on a political commercial where in our last election, we had Donald Trump and Joe Biden talking about why they were the better candidate and what their stances were and why people should vote for them. So we took a simple activity where a couple of years ago, I might've stood up in front of the class talk to them, had notes up on the board, had them copy those notes in, in, in their notebook, and I turned it into a much more engaging activity where they did a lot of that learning at home using um, the information provided for them. And then when I actually got them in the classroom, instead of doing the lecture, we had a hands-on activity with all of our kids engaged, actively questioning each other and uh, voicing their opinions on different topics. So that's just one idea and one way I've learned to use uh, the technology to encompass more hands-on learning for the kids without me having to be uh, the, the leader in the classroom up front doing all of the lecturing. And we've kind of started to flip our classroom where the kids are doing more of that at home so then we can get into more hands-on engaging activities. There's so many other ways um, that you can do activities like this and there's so many great teachers in our district that are doing other activities um, doing very similar things this is this one way that i've started to incorporate uh, the technology into my classroom thank you for uh, taking a couple minutes to listen to this and hopefully you uh, continue to have lots of fun using the technology that's been provided for you from our district <laughs>